let's move to today's speaker. Carlton F.W. Larson, professor of law at the UC Davis School of Law. He is a graduate of Harvard and received his law degree from Yale. His specialty at UC Davis is American constitutional law and Anglo-American legal history with a finer focus on 18th century America. Professor Larson's scholarship has been cited by numerous federal and state courts and has been profiled in the New York Times, The Economist, Time Magazine, and many other publications. He is a frequent commentator on public radio and regularly advises the state le legislature on pending legislation. So as you can hear between Bill and Carlton, we have terrific speakers today. With that said, Carlton. Okay, thank you, James. Uh, and thank you, Bill, for those wonderful poems and the story. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today as part of the series on uh, World War I, as I'm sure previous speakers have noted. Uh, this is the war that's in danger of being uh, the forgotten war. Uh, so we've overshadowed in almost every dimension by World War II. Uh, and indeed, I sometimes wonder if there had been no World War II, would we still be talking about this as the Great War, uh, the defining event uh, of the 20th century? Um, it's a profoundly important war, and I'm delighted that the Sacramento Public Library has been devoting uh, attention to this uh, over the last few years. And a big thank you to James Scott for all the hard work he does uh, in putting this together. Now, from the American perspective, of course, this was initially a war that nobody wanted. Uh, when the war erupted in 1914, President Woodrow Wilson insisted that it was none of America's business, uh, and he successfully ran for re-election uh, on the platform that he kept us out of the war. Uh, initially, there was a general sentiment in favor of Britain and France, a sense that America might profit, perhaps, from the war, uh, but in general, the isolation of sentiment in the country was overwhelming. We don't have reliable public opinion polling in this period, so we can't be especially precise. Uh, but one congressman noted in late 1916 that anyone who advocated for American entry into the war would have been denounced as a madman and a would-be murderer. And yet, when America finally did join the war uh, in 1917, the country went into a period of mass hysteria uh, and paranoid antipathy towards all things German, uh, the German being depicted roughly like this. Uh, consider some of the more striking actions that happened. Uh, the music of Ludwig van Beethoven was banned in Pittsburgh for the duration of the war. What had Beethoven done? He was dead for about 90 years. Well, he hadn't done anything, but he was a German. Uh, and the mere thought of listening to German music was unthinkable. In Lewistown, Montana, a mob seized <coughs> all the German textbooks from a local high school and burned them while a crowd sang the Star Spangled Banner. In Iowa, the state governor, William Harding, issued a proclamation prohibiting the use of any language in public other than English. And this extended to the use of the telephone. One consequence of this was that church services could only be conducted in English, not any other language. But Hardy was unconcerned, as he claimed, quote, there is no use anyone wasting his time praying in languages other than English. God is listening only to the English. <laughs> Study of the German language was removed from many classrooms. Uh, in 1915, about 25% of all American high school students studied German. By the end of the war, only 1% of high schools even offered it. The Los Angeles Board of Education went so far as to prohibit any discussion of peace in the classroom. In August, yeah, sorry, in April, or August 1918, a mob in Minnesota tarred and feathered a German-American farmer named John Mainz for allegedly not supporting the war bond effort. Um, you want to know what happens when you're targeting feathers? It turned out it's not, not very pretty. Um, 
In April 19, 1918, a German-American socialist named Robert Prager was lynched by a mob in Collinsville, Illinois. Eleven men were put on trial for his murder, but the jury acquitted them. <coughs> One member of the jury supposedly bragged that the verdict demonstrated the jury's loyalty to America. German street and town names were changed to English names. You might remember in 2003, uh, when the Congressional Cafeteria changed the name of French fries to Freedom Fries. Uh, well, this essentially happened during World War I also. Uh, sauerkraut became Liberty Cabbage. Uh, hamburgers became Liberty Sandwiches. And strangely, German measles became Liberty Measles. <laughs> I would have let the Germans keep the measles. <laughs> Now, all of this is very, very striking because just a year or two earlier, the isolationist sentiment was equally intense. But the people who retained those sentiments, those people who still opposed the American entry into the war, uh, were now viewed as deeply unpatriotic and fundamentally un-American. There was a complete transformation in public opinion. But American entry into World War I wasn't the only shocking event of 1917, and this is often forgotten. Uh, but this was the year of the Russian Revolution. The government of the Tsar uh, is overthrown and ultimately replaced by a communist government led uh, by Vladimir Lenin, with the result that Russia withdrew from the war. And all of this was a huge shock. Uh, Russia's monarchy dated back hundreds of years. No communists had ever taken control of government anywhere in the world. Uh, and now they had seized power in one of the largest countries in Europe. If it could happen there, could it happen here in the United States? In retrospect, of course, it doesn't seem very likely. But people at the time were not so sure. No one thought it would happen in Russia, in Russia either. And yet it did. So by 1917, we have a population stirred up in a war frenzy and also terrified by potential communist version of the government. If you think that doesn't sound like a very good recipe for the protection of civil liberties, uh, you would be right. Uh, so I want to talk about today is three broad areas of civil liberties during World War I. Uh, first of all, the draft, uh, which turns out to be a surprisingly important part of the World War I story. Uh, second, the treatment of German citizens within the United States. Uh, and then third, the somewhat more well-known story, uh, the story of free speech. Um, anyone who has taken a course in First Amendment law uh, knows that we start the modern story with World War I. Um, so I'll explain a bit how uh, World War I affects the protection of free speech uh, in the United States. OK, so let's start with the draft. Uh, shortly after the declaration of war, Congress enacted a federal draft law. Uh, this probably affected more people directly than almost any other act of the federal government up to that time. 2,820,000 men were drafted into the armed services under this law. Uh, fully 72% of those who served during World War I uh, did so because they were drafted. Uh, voluntary enlistments hadn't gone uh, particularly well. Um, and I quickly like this sign because it doesn't say register for the draft. It's much more candid. Right? It tells you you're registering for the war. Uh, initially, the draft applied only to men ages 21 to 30. Uh, the ground that, well, you can't vote. And if you're under 21, then you should vote. You shouldn't be drafted. Um, but in August 1918, it was uh, expanded uh, to include men ages 18 to 45. Uh, now, it did have uh, pretty broad protections, however, for conscientious objectors uh, who were allowed to perform non-combat roles. Now, the draft was almost immediately challenged as unconstitutional. And although the draft is now widely accepted, the arguments against it uh, were actually somewhat stronger than one might expect. Historically, uh, a federal draft was an anomaly. Uh, a federal draft was first proposed during the War of 1812, uh, but the idea was highly controversial uh, and was never enacted. One of the strongest opponents of the draft 
uh, with the famous New Hampshire lawyer and senator, <coughs> Daniel Webster, who argued strenuously that a federal draft was unconstitutional. Here's Webster in 1814. He said, this is on the floor of the Senate, where is it written in the Constitution? In what article or section is it contained that you may take children from their parents and parents from their children and compel them to fight the battles of any war in which the folly or the wickedness of government may engage in? Under what concealment has this power lain hidden which now for the first time comes forth with a tremendous and baleful aspect to trample <coughs> down and destroy the dearest rights of personal liberty. Sir, I almost disdain to go to quotations and references to prove that such an abominable doctrine has no foundation in the constitution of the country. Now, criticism like this led the James Madison administration to abandon any attempt at federal draft. Uh, by the time of World War I, there had been only one federal draft in American history, uh, a much more limited draft during, during the Civil War. Uh, most Civil War soldiers, uh, unlike World War I soldiers, were, were volunteers. Uh, but that draft notoriously allowed people to hire a substitute for $300. Uh, that was deliberately rejected uh, for the World War I draft. There would be no ability of rich people to buy themselves out. Uh, but even the Civil War draft, uh, was bitterly unpopular in places. Uh, one of the worst outbreaks of urban violence in American history uh, was the New York City draft riots of July 1863, just a few weeks after the Battle of Gettysburg. The riots lasted several days and killed over 100 people and injured several thousand more. The Chief Justice of the United States, Roger Taney, authored the infamous Dred Scott decision, had privately drafted an opinion holding the Civil War draft unconstitutional. During the Civil War, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court held the draft unconstitutional, but then reversed itself. So by the time of World War I, uh, there was no clear holding from the United States Supreme Court uh, that a federal draft was, in fact, constitutional. Uh, that meant it was at least an open question uh, and could be challenged in court. Now, it wouldn't necessarily be easy to find good lawyers for this cause. Uh, the Illinois Bar Association, for example, declared that it was unpatriotic and unprofessional for an attorney to represent an accused draft debater. The cases were eventually filed uh, and arguments reached uh, the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, the challengers to the draft made a number of arguments. Uh, First Amendment, separation of powers, uh, due process. Uh, the strongest arguments uh, were rest, rested on federalism and the 13th Amendment. Uh, so the federalism argument went essentially like this. Uh, to the extent that the government can compel people to perform military <coughs> service, that's a function reserved to state government. Um, states historically had had militias, which included all able-bodied adult men. Uh, and uh, what could happen is that a state would you know, organize its militia, and if the federal government needed that militia, it could federalize the militia and bring it into national service. But the argument was that the federal government simply couldn't evade that step by directly drafting people into the federal army. Um, related to this would be the Second Amendment, uh, a well-regulated militia being necessary to protection of the free state, uh, the right of people to keep their arms from not being infringed. Um, a sense there that the federal government has somewhat limited power <coughs> over state militias. Uh, and so as a matter of just basic federal structure, you can't sidestep the militia system and bring people directly into the federal army. OK, so that was the argument made in the 19th century by Daniel Webster uh, and by Chief Justice Connolly. Now the other argument um, was this. Here's the 13th Amendment which was passed in 1865, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime wherever the parties were newly convicted, shall exist within the United States. Uh, the argument is not that the draft was slavery, uh, but the draft was involuntary servitude. Uh, indeed, the draft was seen literally to be uh, involuntary servitude. Uh, and that argument wasn't available to Daniel Webster or to Tyson, of course, it came after 
about the Civil War. Now, on January 7, uh, 1918, the Supreme Court issued its decision uh, on the draft. The draft was upheld uh, unanimously. Uh, the opinion was by Chief Justice Edward Douglas White. Uh, and most of the arguments against the draft were dismissed uh, pretty dismissively. Uh, involuntary servitude dismissed in one sentence. Here's, this is the last sentence of the opinion. We are unable to conceive upon what theory the exaction by government from the citizen of the performance of his supreme and noble duty of contributing to the defense of the rights and honor of the nation as a result of a war declared by the great representative body of the people can be said to be the imposition of involuntary servitude in violation of the prohibition of the 13th Amendment. We are constrained to the conclusion that the contention to that effect is refuted by its mere statement. End of analysis. Um, so simply stating it was enough to conclude that it was wrong. Um, but uh, White did spend a bit of time dealing with this federalism argument, because I think it did uh, trouble him. Uh, and ultimately, the court concluded uh, that the power to raise and support an army clearly entailed a draft. Uh, that is, when you read federal powers broadly, uh, and going back to cases like McCulloch versus Bremer in the 19th century, the government has essentially any means it deems appropriate to carry federal powers into effect. Um, at the end of the day, uh, White gives us a broad reading of federal power, uh, and federal power trumps state law. Now, there is something of an irony here. Uh, Chief Justice White spends a lot of time talking about the supremacy of the federal government and its extensive powers to raise an army. And he relied on the precedent of the draft during the Civil War. Chief Justice White served in the Civil War, but on the side of the Confederacy. Uh, he remains the only Chief Justice who had previously taken up arms against his country. Uh, and very strangely, in his opinion of holding the draft, he also cited numerous decisions by Confederate state Supreme Courts upholding the Confederate draft. Now, it was probably inevitable that the court would decide the issue the way it did. Um, the likelihood that in the middle of a war, the Supreme Court would declare that essentially 72% of the people fighting their army were there unconstitutionally. Um, that was just never going to happen, uh, just as a matter of, of practical uh, reality. Um, so I'm not at all surprised how the court decided uh, the way they did. Um, but that opinion upholding uh, the federal draft uh, remains, of course, good law to this day, uh, and that is a significant legacy uh, of World War I. Okay, um, so just a little bit about um, the issue of alien enemies. Uh, and if we compare this to World War II, the World War II precedent, of course, of the Japanese internment, uh, where we've got um, you know, 100,000 people, many of whom are American citizens, interned. Uh, during the war. Uh, is there anything equivalent uh, in World War I? No, we don't have anything of that scope uh, happening there. Um, but um, there is always the concern uh, of what people at the time referred to as enemy aliens. Uh, alien here being a non-citizen, uh, and enemy meaning that they are from a country with which uh, we are at war. Um, so that meant that any uh, German citizen living in the United States and not yet naturalized as a United States citizen uh, was deemed an enemy alien. Uh, now, German Americans as a group, of course, were not uh, interned. Um, they were the largest non English speaking group in the United States. According to the 1910 census, nearly 9% of Americans were either first or second generation German American. Uh, so, a widespread internment of German Americans was simply not. Uh, thinkable. But German citizens in the United States pose a different issue. Uh, so the initial target was male Germans. Uh, male German citizens were required to register with the government. Uh, they were restricted from possessing firearms, aircraft, and wireless equipment. Certain areas were designated off limits, uh, including docks, railroads, and warehouses. Uh, they could not travel by plane and they were barred from the District of Columbia. 
Uh, these restrictions were extended to Austro-Hungarians in December 1917 uh, and to German women in 1918, April of 1918. Uh, now, German citizens were subject to uh, internment uh, if the government had suspicions about them. Uh, and ultimately, about 2,300 German nationals uh, were interned during the war. Uh, there were four primary internment camps. Uh, here's a picture of an internment camp in Hot Springs, North Carolina, uh, where the internees built their own German village. <laughs> um, significantly, uh, the tamed German nationals, as well as German corporations, uh, were subject to property seizure. Uh, ultimately, the government seized hundreds of millions of dollars in private property uh, from German sources. Now, the government, for example, seized all the American assets of the Bayer Chemical Company, uh, which lost its U.S. patent uh, for aspirin. Okay, so the really big story uh, of civil liberties in World War I is that of freedom of speech uh, and freedom of press. Uh, at the federal level, uh, there have been very little uh, in terms of restrictions on freedom of speech uh, since the short-lived Sedition Act of 1798. Uh, to the extent there were restrictions on speech in the United States, uh, they were done by uh, state governments. Uh, but World War I changed, uh, and there were two significant statutes, uh, the Espionage Act of 1917 and the Sedition Act of 1918. Okay, so we can start with the Espionage Act of 1917. Uh, among other things, uh, it prohibits causing or attempting to cause <coughs> subordination, disloyalty, mutiny, or refusal of duty in the military or naval forces of the United States, or willfully obstructing the recruiting or enlistment service of the United States. Uh, this could be punished by a fine of up to $10,000 and imprisonment from up to 20 years. And again, $10,000 a lot uh, in 1970. Now, you could interpret this statute pretty narrowly uh, and say, well, what it prohibits is sort of directly interfering with the recruitment services of the United States. Um, but that's not the way uh, the Woodrow Wilson administration chose uh, to interpret it. Uh, it is likely that they went far beyond the scope of Congress's intent uh, with this uh, law. Uh, Wilson wanted a tougher law. He was disappointed uh, with the version that was passed. Uh, in 1917, the Attorney General of the United States said the people who opposed the war, may God have mercy on them, for they need expect none from an outraged people and an avenging government. Okay, so that's not going to go well when the Attorney General of the United States is talking about an outraged people and an avenging government. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, several thousand people were prosecuted under the Espionage Act, uh, often for saying nothing more uh, than that they thought the war was wrong. Uh, a Newark man received five years in prison and a thousand dollar fine for saying I can't see how the government can compel troops to go to France. If it was up to me, I'd tell them to go to hell. <laughs> the editor of the Jewish Daily News, Rose Pastor Stokes, received 10 years in prison for stating, I am for the people, while the government is for the profiteers. The movie producer, Robert Goldstein, was sentenced to 10 years in prison for producing this movie an historical movie that, among other things, truthfully depicted British soldiers bayoneting women and children during the Revolutionary War. What's wrong with that? Well, that reflected poorly on an ally of the United States during the war. Here it was 76. <laughs> <laughs> the reels of the film were seized and destroyed, uh, and only a few still shots of this movie uh, remain. Now, as one critic at the time pointed out, by this logic, singing the Star Spangled Banner would also violate the Espionage Act, uh, because that song also reflects poorly on the British. <laughs> uh, a lot of the people targeted uh, were ministers, uh, particularly those serving German immigrant communities. It was feared that these people were stirring up disloyalty from the pulpit. One Christian minister received 10 years in prison for distributing a pamphlet arguing that fighting in the war is inconsistent 
with Christian values. Now, many ministers actually took the opposite view. Um, United States Senator Hiram Johnson of California complained that the clergy were converting the lowly Nazarene into a swashbuckling warrior in helmet and war paint, reveling in blood and carnage. Now, the most famous person convicted under the Espionage Act uh, was this man, uh, Eugene Debs, uh, the prominent leader of the American Socialist Party, four-time candidate for President of the United States, and he was convicted for criticizing the draft and the nation's war motives in a speech at a Socialist Party picnic. He ran for president again uh, in 1920 from prison and received nearly one million votes uh, from prisoners. Now, the Espionage Act allowed the government to exclude material from the mail uh, if they thought that the material uh, might violate the Espionage Act. Um, so here is the source master general at the time, Albert Burleson, the former congressman from Texas, who said that under the Espionage Act, quote, people cannot say that this government got in the war wrong, that it is in it for the wrong purposes, or anything that will impugn the motive of the government for going into the war. They cannot say that this government is the tool of Wall Street or the munitions makers. That kind of thing makes for insubordination in the Army and Navy and breeds a spirit of disloyalty throughout the country. It is a false statement, a lie, and it will not be permitted. Okay, so one of the casualties uh, of this policy uh, was a journal called uh, The Masses. Uh, this was a radical left-wing journal uh, that catered to a small intellectual elite in New York. Many prominent people contributed, uh, including the poet Charles Sandberg. Uh, and The Masses took the position uh, that World War I was unjustified and served mainly to benefit the rich at the expense of the poor, who were then drafted to fight the war. Uh, and one of the ways it did so was through uh, cartoons. Um, one cartoon, I don't have it on the slide, but it's a, uh, a shattered living spell that the war has damaged liberty uh, in the United States. Um, another is this one. Um, it shows figures labeled youth and labor tied to a cannon, uh, which is crushing a figure labeled uh, democracy. So the New York Postmaster said, well, I can't mail this magazine uh, because this violates the Espionage Act. How? Well, a soldier might see that, or a recruit might see that cartoon, conclude that the war is a bad idea, and then they won't show up to fight. And so therefore, this is excluded from the mail. Um, the massive magazine sued the Postmaster. Uh, they won in federal district court on statutory grounds, uh, but the postmaster won on appeal, and the masses went out of business uh, a few months later. Uh, it turns out if you have a journal, and you can't send it through the mails, you just can't sell uh, subscriptions uh, to your journal. Uh, now this all seems pretty bad uh, from a free speech perspective, and it is. Uh, but it was about to get worse. In 1918, the Espionage Act was amended uh, and these amendments are known as the Sedition Act of 1918. Uh, and this, among other things, whoever, when the United States is at war, shall willfully utter, print, write, or publish any disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the form of government of the United States, or the Constitution of the United States, or the military or naval forces of the United States, or any language intended to bring the form of government of the United States into contempt, scorn, contumely, or disrepute shall be punished by a fine of not more than $10,000 or imprisonment for not more than 20 years or both. Uh, this is an extraordinary statute. Um, read literally, it would mean that if I said something like, I think the Electoral College is stupid, uh, it is a terrible part of our Constitution, it should be amended, uh, that would violate the Sedition Act um, because it is scurrilous language about the form of government in the United States and it brings the form of government in the United States into contempt. Uh, not surprisingly, this was controversial. Um, there was strong opposition in the United States Senate 
uh, it passed only 48 to 26. A member of the U.S. House said that this was the most mischievous piece of legislation ever imposed upon a free people. In an editorial in the Kansas Star, ex-president Theodore Roosevelt bitterly denounced the act as the work of foolish and traitorous people who made it a crime to tell the truth about the administration when it is guilty of incompetence and other shortcomings. The people of the United States, Roosevelt said, are the president's fellow citizens, not his subjects. The Sedition Act was unconstitutional, and he, Roosevelt, would personally give the government the opportunity to test his constitutionality. Uh, Jeffrey Stone, a uh, leading scholar of free speech in wartime, describes this law as the most repressive legislation in American history, uh, at least when it comes to speech. Now, it turns out there were numerous prosecutions as well under state law. Uh, many states had parallel versions of the Espionage Act or the Seditions Act. Uh, and large numbers of people went to jail for 20 years or more. 33 states made it a crime to possess or display red or black flags, the symbols of communism and anarchism. The famous English playwright George Bernard Shaw would write, during the war, the courts in France, bleeding under German guns, were very severe. The courts in England, hearing about the echoes of those guns, were grossly unjust. But the courts of the United States, knowing not save censored news of those guns, were stark, staring, raving mad. And inevitably, the question arises, are these laws consistent uh, with the First Amendment uh, that says Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances? And that's a very, very important question. Uh, because if the First Amendment doesn't protect people in a democracy arguing about whether or not the war they are fighting is worthwhile, um, you know, one of the most basic questions that any democracy can, can ask itself uh, then the First Amendment really doesn't protect much of anything. Uh, and so from our perspective, it is crystal clear uh, that laws like this violate the First Amendment. We are used to endless criticism of wars. We think back to the Iraq War, uh, where even you know, protests during Vietnam. Um, clearly, people have a right to disagree uh, about the war. Um, but in World War I, this was not necessarily an easy issue. Uh, and here's why. If we want to know what this language, freedom of speech or of the press, means, uh, well, this was written in uh, 1789, adopted in 1791. And so if we look at it in its 18th century context, it may very well mean something different uh, than what we are used to. In 1769, William Blackstone published the fourth volume of his commentary. <coughs> Uh, and here's what Blackstone wrote. He said, the liberty of the press is indeed essential to the nature of a free state. <clears throat> but this consists in weighing no previous restraints upon publication, and not in freedom from censure for criminal matter when published. <clears throat> okay, so what does that mean? Well, it means is that you can't have a censorship board. You can't have a system where you have to submit your publication or your speech in advance to a censor who will then decide whether or not the speech or the writings goes forward. <coughs> that is prohibited. But if you do say something and it turns out what you say is harmful, then the government can punish you after the fact, or you could be sued uh, after the fact. Uh, and that was the perspective of William Blackstone. He said, well, fine, he's an Englishman. Uh, not an American, and he wrote this, you know, well before the U.S. Constitution was written. Um, but it turns out Blackstone is probably the most influential figure in uh, American law. Uh, to the extent that American lawyers learned law in the 18th and 19th centuries, they did it by reading the four volumes of uh, William Blackstone. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, for example, when he advised young lawyers in 1861 what to read, first thing you do, read the four volumes of Blackstone. Uh, and this was what the courts had essentially adopted as the meaning of the First Amendment. Uh, as recently as 1907, 
so just 10 years earlier, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court had accepted this view and said that free, free press under the Constitution means what Blackstone said. That is, we can't restrict it ahead of time. But if the speech turns out to have a bad tendency, it can be punished after the fact. And if that's all the First Amendment means, then the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act are clearly constitutional. All these convictions and sentences are just fine. Now, inevitably, this issue is going to end up uh, in the US Supreme Court. Okay, so in 1919, uh, the constitutionality of the Espionage Act uh, was addressed in a case called Schenck versus United States. Uh, and the defendants were convicted under the Espionage Act uh, for sending circulars to drafted men. Uh, that is, they mailed they list this item in the mail to people who were uh, subject to the draft. And it's a two-sided thing. Uh, and on the first side, it says, assert your rights. Uh, and on the back, it says, long live the Constitution of the United States. Um, all right, so let me just read, read a little bit of what it was that they are arguing. Uh, in this pamphlet. So from this part, uh, assert your rights. Uh, they criticize the draft and they criticize the war. They say the fathers who fought and bled to establish a free and independent nation here in America were so opposed to the militarism of the old world from which they had escaped, so keenly alive to the dangers and hardships they had undergone fleeing from political, religious, and military oppression, that they handed down to us certain rights which must be retained by the people. Um, they opposed the spirit of militarism, and therefore they said that the militia could only be used to execute laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasion. And fighting in World War I wasn't suppressing an insurrection or repelling uh, an invasion. No power was delegated to send our citizens away to foreign shores, to sh shoot in people of other lands, no matter what their internal or international disputes. People of this country did not vote in favor of war. In the last election, they voted against war. No specious or plausible pleas about a war for democracy can be cloud the issue. Democracy cannot be shot into a nation. It must come spontaneously and purely from within. Now, in the second half, um, along with the Constitution of the United States, uh, they make specific arguments against conscription. And you'll notice they cite at the very top the 13th Amendment. Uh, and the language of involuntary servitude as to why this is not uh, permissible. Uh, and these people are not people who hate the U.S. Constitution. By their own lights, they, they love it. They say the Constitution of the United States is one of the greatest bulwarks of political liberty. In this battle, the people of the United States establish a principle that freedom of the individual and personal liberty are the most sacred things in life. Without them, we become slaves. When you conscript a man and compel him to go abroad to fight against his will, you violate the most sacred right of personal liberty and substitute for it what Daniel Webster called despotism in its worst form. So again, drawing on the Daniel Webster argument from the War of 1812. A conscript is a little better than a convict. He is deprived of his liberty and of his right to think and act as a free man. A conscripted citizen is forced to surrender his right as a citizen and become a subject. He is forced into involuntary servitude, he is deprived of the protection given him by the Constitution of the United States. He is deprived of all freedom of conscience and being forced to kill against his will. So at the end, they say, write to your congressman and tell him you want the draft law repealed. Do not submit to intimidation. You have a right to demand the repeal of any law. Exercise your rights of free speech, peaceful assemblage, and petitioning the government for a redress of grievances. OK, so that's the flyer. And they were convicted under Section 3 of the Espionage Act for willfully obstructing the recruiting or enlistment service of the United States. And when the case reached the United States Supreme Court, it was decided unanimously in an opinion by Oliver Wendell Holmes. And the Supreme Court unanimously upheld the conviction under the Espionage Act. Holmes' language includes some of the most memorable language in a Supreme Court opinion. He says, we admit that in many places and in ordinary times, the defendants, in saying all that was in the circular, would have been within their constitutional rights. 
but the character of every act depends upon the circumstances in which it is done. The most stringent protection of free speech when not protecting man in falsely shouting fire in theater and causing a panic. Now, you've all heard this phrase, right? Shouting fire uh, in a theater. Uh, and it's, you know, someone, as a rejoinder to the idea that all rights are unlimited, sure, it, it's a perfect rejoinder. Nobody would think that anyone has a constitutional right to do that. Uh, but there's a couple of points worth noting about this. Uh, first of all, there's a very big difference between falsely showing fire in a theater and distributing this pamphlet. This pamphlet is a matter entirely of opinion. It is an argument about what the Constitution means. Uh, whereas falsely shouting fire in a theater is making a false statement of fact. Right? Either there is a fire or uh, there isn't. Uh, second, in the example of the theater, uh, there is no opportunity for reasoned debate in response to the speech. Right? Everybody's just going to flee uh, in a panic. Uh, so as one legal scholar at the time said, a better analogy is a man who gets up in a theater between the acts and informs the audience honestly, but perhaps mistakenly, that the fire exits are too few or locked. Uh, that would be closer uh, to the circular chain. Uh, and then finally, you almost always hear this described uh, as showing fire in a crowded theater. Uh, but that's not what Holmes wrote. He said, falsely shouting fire in a theater. So he emphasizes falsely. And he doesn't say anything about the theater being crowded. So why does everybody say that the theater is crowded? Where did the crowd come from? <laughs> <laughs> no. A few years ago, I set out to answer that question. Uh, and one of the things I wondered was, had this actually happened? Um, was there an incident of someone falsely shouting fire? in a theater. And it turns out, yes, it happened. And it happened a lot. It was a persistent problem in the United States and England uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Hundreds of people <laughs> were killed or injured because of people falsely <laughs> shouting fire in theaters. One of the worst incidents occurred in Calumet, Michigan uh, in 1913, where a strike breaker entered the Italian hall where a Christmas party for the children of strike, strike and copper miners was being held. He falsely shouted fire, a panic ensued, and at least 73 people were killed, 62 of them children. Indeed, the problem was so pervasive that the person who shouted fire in a crowded theater became a recognizable stock villain, condemned in newspapers from coast to coast. And that's how he was described, <coughs> as shouting fire in a crowded theater. So when people continue to say that the theater was crowded, uh, it's not because they're misquoting Alder and Holmes, uh, but because they're drawing on an older oral tradition uh, in which this was a significant part uh, of public culture. Um, if you're interested, I have a large article on this subject. You can get it off my faculty page at, at UC Davis. Um, but the, the point is here, Holmes was not being creative or clever with this example. He was pulling the most trite example you could imagine uh, out of the newspaper. It would be like someone saying the most stringent protection of gun rights would not protect the man from going into a school and shooting children. Well, duh, of course not. No one thinks that it does. Um, the real question is, you know, how does it help answer more difficult cases? So that's essentially what Holmes was saying with this theater example. Uh, not really on point. OK, so if the First Amendment doesn't protect this, what does it protect? Uh, well, the court tells us this in Shane. The question in every case is whether the words are used in such circumstances and are of such a nature as to create a clear and present danger that they will bring about the substantive evils that Congress has a right to prevent. It is a question of proximity and degree. When a nation is at war, many things that might be said in time of peace are such a hindrance to its effort that their utterance will not be endured so long as men fight, and that no court could regard them as protected by any constitutional right. Now, under this test, the anti-draft pamphlets are unprotected. But you'll notice that there's actually a significant move here. You'll notice what the court does not say. They do not say that freedom of speech means only 
freedom from prior censorship. And the opinion actually says it may be that the prohibition of laws abridging the freedom of speech is not confined to previous constraints. Uh, that was the notion from Blackstone. That was the notion suggested in Patterson versus Colorado in 1907. Uh, but that notion doesn't appear anywhere here in Chang. Uh, it would never appear again. The First Amendment means more than that. Uh, even if not much more, and how much more that is left for future cases. Okay, so the Espionage Act uh, unanimously upheld. But what about the Sedition Act, which is an even more oppressive statute? Well, that statute also reached the Supreme Court uh, in 1919 uh, in the case of Abrams versus the United States. So what happened here? Well, in August 1918, uh, while the war was still going on, the defendants printed circulars in New York City and distributed them. Uh, most of them were thrown out of a window uh, onto a Manhattan street, but some of them were distributed uh, more typically. Uh, and these circulars were critical of US involvement in Russia during the Russian Civil War, that followed the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, basically, American troops invaded Russia uh, during World War I. Uh, US troops arrived in August of 1918 and stayed until 1920, uh, mostly in eastern Russia, aiding Tsarist forces that were opposed uh, to the Russian Revolution. Uh, so the circulars uh, urged workers of the world to awake, sought the general strike in the United States, uh, and condemned uh, the American government for its intervention uh, in Russia. Now, the defendants were convicted under the Sedition Act for bringing the government of the United States into disrepute, and they were sentenced to 20 years in prison. When their case reached the US Supreme Court, the Supreme Court again affirmed the conviction including that the Schenck case disposed of all issues relating to the constitutionality of the Espionage Act, and by extension, it also resolved the issue of the Sedition Act. So the only issue is sufficiency of the evidence on intent, and that was an issue left to the jury. Now that was a total compound, um, because the language of the Sedition Act is much different uh, than the language of the Espionage Act. And at least in Schenck, you could say, well, there the defendants sent the flyers directly to enlisted men, so there's more of a connection with disrupting the armed forces, uh, than these people who simply threw it out a window. Uh, but now something surprising happened. Uh, two justices dissented. You remember Shank is unanimous? This one is now a dissent. Two justices, Alderman Holmes and Lewis Brandy. Uh, and the language in Justice Holmes's dissent is one of the most famous passages ever written about the value and purpose of freedom of speech. Uh, three of his fellow justices visited him at his house uh, to try to persuade him not to issue this dissent, but he did it anyway. Uh, and this is the first time that any US Supreme Court justice had given a clear articulation of the value of freedom of speech. <laughs> he says, persecution for the expression of opinions seems to me perfectly logical. If you have no doubt of your premises or your power, and want a certain result with all your heart, you naturally express your wishes in law and sweep away all opposition. But when men have realized that time has upset many fighting faiths, uh, and I think here this is sort of an implicit reference to World War I itself. Uh, that is, by late 1919, uh, when Holmes was writing, there was already uh, some disillusionment about World War I, whether it was actually worth getting into. And here's an interesting data point. A 1937 Gallup poll showed that 64% of Americans thought that intervention in World War I was a mistake. That is, 20 years later, nearly two-thirds of Americans now claim to agree with all those people who went to prison during the war. So when men have realized that times have set many fighting faiths, they may come to believe, even more than they believe, the very foundations of their own conduct, the ultimate good desired is better reached by free trade in ideas. But the best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market. And that truth is the only ground upon which their wishes safely can be carried out. That, at any rate, is the theory of our Constitution. According to Holmes, the expression of opinions should be checked only if they so imminently threaten immediate interference with the lawful and pressing purposes of the law that an immediate check is required to save the country. The opinions expressed here didn't even come close. He said this was a silly leaflet 
produced by poor and puny anonymity. Uh, no threat whatsoever to the United States. So something had happened. Uh, just a few months earlier, uh, Holmes had adopted the clear and present danger test for a unanimous court upholding the Espionage Act. But now he sounds very different. Holmes insisted he didn't change his mind. He said the two cases can be reconciled. Uh, but very few people take Holmes at his word. Um, and they believe that the Abrams dissent uh, is a significant new direction in First Amendment law, uh, one that is much more protective uh, of free speech. Uh, and if you want to learn more about this, uh, my friend Thomas Healy uh, at Seton uh, Hall Law School has a great book uh, called The Great Dissent, How Oliver Wendell Holmes Changed His Mind and Changed the History of Free Speech uh, in America. <coughs> Uh, and Healy argues that Holmes was influenced by a number of younger scholars with whom he was close, and that Abrams was a significant departure uh, from Shane. Now, in the court of history, it's pretty clear that Holmes' views have carried the day. Uh, his descent in Abrams has become canonical. It is now routinely cited as if it were a uh, majority opinion. The Sedition Act was repealed in 1920. And in the early 1920s, all the people convicted of speech offenses under the Espionage and Sedition Acts were released from prison. Uh, the last person was released uh, December 15, 1923, under President Alvin Coolidge. Now, the Espionage Acts, however, remains in effect to this day. Um, not the provisions at issue here, but other provisions of the Espionage Act, which form um, part of our law today, which is invoked in cases ranging from Edward Stone uh, through other claims of leaks and all kinds of other things. Uh, but it's not used the way that it was during World War I. All right, so to end up with just a slightly happier note, um, <laughs> to see just how much Holmes' dissent carried today, uh, we can compare the treatment of free speech during World War I uh, to the treatment of free speech during World War II. So in 1940, uh, when the United States was not in World War II, but it was raging in Europe. Uh, the United States decided, uh, the Supreme Court decided a case called Minersville School District versus Tobias. Uh, and the court held by an eight to one vote that laws requiring school children to salute the flag were constitutional. Uh, and this was the way that the flag salute was done during that period with the arm outstretched uh, like this. And this was challenged by Jehovah's Witnesses who said that this infringed on their freedom of religion. But the Supreme Court disagreed eight to one and said no, the Jehovah's Witnesses could be forced to do this. Now, the reaction across the country to this decision was extraordinary. Americans interpreted the court's decision as saying that Jehovah's Witnesses were not patriotic. Mob attacks against witnesses broke out in various locations around the country. Witnesses' houses were burned. In one instance, a witness was publicly castrated. Witnesses were fired from their jobs. Thousands of children were expelled from school and had no place to turn for education. Many historians believe this is the worst outbreak of religious persecution in the United States in the 20th century. And many Americans, including Supreme Court justices, were completely and totally appalled. One of them, I think, was Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, he would soon deliver his four freedom speech recognizing freedom of speech and freedom of religion as the first two most important freedoms. Now, the next year, 1941, the United States is attacked Pearl Harbor, and we enter World War II. And in 1943, in the middle of World War II, another case was brought by Jehovah's Witnesses, again challenging the flag salute law. Uh, and it was brought by these women here, the Barnett sisters. You can see them there as they were when they challenged the law. Here they are later. Uh, in life. And now the Supreme Court said that no, schools cannot do this. That no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. Now, how did they go from 8 to 1 in 1940 to this decision in 19, 8 to 1 the other way? Uh, in 1943. Well, there have been some changes on the court. Uh, but I think several, several justices actually did change their minds uh, in response to this outbreak of religious violence. 
Uh, moreover, the example of Nazi Germany uh, was significant. Uh, this is a deliberate contrast with Hitler uh, and the Nazi salute. Uh, our children in America are not the Roosevelt youth analogs of the Hitler youth. Our children will think for themselves. Hitler had forced Jehovah's Witnesses into concentration camps for refusing to offer the Hitler salute. Americans will not do that. Indeed, President Roosevelt never publicly supported the Providers' decision. And American opinion, public opinion, was largely on the side of school children. Time Magazine reported the decision under the headline, Block Removed. So the difference, uh, both in the attitude of the Supreme Court, the attitude of the executive branch, and the attitude of the public at large, uh, could not have been more different uh, during World War II uh, than it was during World War I. Uh, and so to that extent, World War I has left us a very important legacy. Uh, by teaching by example just how bad things can go uh, when free speech is not protected. Uh, and it's a lesson uh, that, of course, every generation uh, needs to learn uh, for itself.